Hi everybody. Over the last year, I've been covering the rise of psychedelic capitalism. And to be honest, it's been quite a difficult process. I've always believed that psychedelics have the potential to change society, but it increasingly looks like they're being commoditized by its worst aspects. This film is about a journey I've been on, speaking with key figures in the field, and why it's led me from feeling cynical to believing that psychedelics could radically transform culture. For legalization of psychedelics. Psilocybin, LSD, DMT. You know, we thought we were getting the age of Aquarius. We're gonna get Prozac Nation 2.0. If you simply want to go into the woods and pick mushrooms and, and eat them, people should have the right to do that. Broadened awareness of self and other and nature and interconnectedness. We must start, start to relate to the real indigenous people that live in their own flesh right here and right now. It's an opportunity for investors. It's really the overbroad, aggressive use of the patents to try to block competitors that's the real problem. To say what has never been said, to see what has never been seen. One of the main themes we've covered on Rebel Wisdom is the meaning crisis. So this deep sense of disconnection many feel and the idea that we're culturally adrift. Arguably, this crisis is what's fueling our political polarization, maybe even the mental health crisis. My main inquiry over the last year has been whether psychedelics can help us solve these big social problems, which was the original vision of the psychedelic counterculture. A lot of people believe that psychedelics can help us to reconnect and in doing so change our whole operating system and maybe go to the heart of the meaning crisis. But to see how that could work, we can start by looking at how they treat mental illness. So here's the world's leading psychedelic researcher, Robin Carhart Harris. We've been talking today about all the various problems we face and in particular the, the kind of something that always comes out for me is like we need new ideas right now. We need new ideas to solve complex problems. And we also need ways to let go of bad ideas. Our kind of, our kind of rigid fixation on our own politics, our own ideology. And there's a correlate in, in some of your research around the default mode network, this area of the brain and, the, and kind of the loosening, I guess, would be a word you could use of what happens in the brain when we take psychedelics. So be, be interesting to hear a little bit about what, what you've actually found in regards to that is happening in our brains when we take psychedelics. Yeah. We do need new ideas, but you know, so, some old ideas are um, kind of, in a sense, what psychedelics awaken people to, you know. Um, but the, the, the science, uh, I think it's, it's helpful. It, it's enriching, really, in terms of uh, our understanding of things. And the default mode network, uh, for those who don't know, is a particular system that is especially developed in the human brain. Uh, it's, it's a system that covers a lot of the brain, medial prefrontal cortex, and anyway, <laughs> a lot of it. Um, and yes, it's expanded massively in our species. It houses the, the sort of um, proteomic or, in a sense, molecular targets for the drug itself. These serotonin receptors, they're called serotonin 2A receptors. They're involved in something called plasticity plasticity, gosh, um, which is the ability to change or be shaped or molded. Um, and they're also involved in brain growth itself. Um, so they've been linked to the evolution of the human brain quite recently. There's some compelling evidence to support that. Um, so yeah, these, this system, this human system, if you want, associated with analytical thinking, abstraction, imagination, all of those faculties that perhaps we have to a greater degree than other animals, I think it's fair to say, that breaks down. That breaks down. It sort of disintegrates as ego disintegrates under a big dose of a psychedelic. Um, and uh, the product of that effect is the psychedelic experience, is, you know, these uh, broadened awareness of self and other and nature and interconnectedness. And those are old ideas, you know. <laughs> so it's like humans 
we think we've become so smart in a way with all that analytical thinking and uh, you know uh, what you realize through the psychedelic experience is that the, the, the smartness is in that simplicity you know when you can wipe that uh, that analytical egoistic mind away for a, for a period I mean there's functions to the ego but uh, but uh, that's really the power I think in, in what they do but it's not just the drug that allows us to do that. It's the drug in combination with therapy. So I spoke to psychedelic therapist Maria Papaspiru and Tim Reed to find out more. And Tim, you, you're a, a psychiatrist, so you've really worked in the, the kind of, let's say, the, the mainstream medical establishment in mental health, and you're also a psychedelic therapist. So could you talk a little bit about that, the differences between these two different models of healing? So if you have depression, for example, and you go to see your GP, your GP may well give you an antidepressant, an SSRI antidepressant probably, um, or signpost you to uh, a, a psychological treatment. Um, and sometimes the antidepressants are really quite helpful and sometimes they work quite well and people go away quite satisfied. Um, but the issue there is is that you're, by, by giving somebody an antidepressant, your, the, the paradigm is, is that this is, um, this is an illness, it's bad luck, something has happened to you or your, 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 your genetic programming is playing out in a certain way and the tablets will make you better. So there's nothing that you really need to think about, there's nothing that you really need to do. Um, so it's not a growth orientated model. In fact, you're, you're, you're colluding with people's wish in a way not to look at themselves, not to look at any problematic patterns of interaction that they might be getting into. So in, it, it, for some people it can be quite helpful, for other people it can be unhelpful by perpetuating certain relationship patterns, etc. So if we think about the, the general model, you know, you, you have a medical model that started looking at treatment, but it spread way beyond the medical realm and we started understanding any process of repair or regeneration in these terms. You know, you go somewhere, you take something and you get fixed and you can carry on without really having to worry about anything. I think both psychotherapy and psychedelic therapy really draw that back. You know, you go somewhere, you take something, it does something to you and then you have to grapple with that something that happens and then it's your task and then you become part of the process you don't become disconnected from the process of becoming of learning of developing um, so i see more parallels between the two than 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 differences but that's also because of how i understand psychotherapy um, and, and I think there's something around the, the, the question of, of um, human will. You know, how, how does change happen? And you have again paradigms that say, well, change happens because you train yourself to change, because you decide to change, because you just make these little tweaks and you change. Uh, but I understand that change comes from much deeper places, places we perhaps don't have words for, places that we might encounter on some level, but it's not necessarily a cognitive level. Um, so both in the work I do with people in, in, a, in a psychotherapeutic format and in my understanding of psychedelic work, I think this is the base, this is the foundation. We have to go to much deeper spaces to really find this movement of change. We have to surrender to it. Sometimes change comes through a, a terrible misfortune, through things that really we, uh, through initiations, life puts us through. Um, and again, we don't have very good paradigms in our society for understanding the spaces and respecting the spaces and allowing the spaces to be, as, as Tim said, that word growthful. You know, what makes things growthful is a key question in, in both of these paradigms. If psychedelic therapy can shift our personal perception, could they also shift our cultural frameworks? So the hope that they can has been a driving force for psychedelic counterculture for well over 70 years. And nobody embodied it more than Terence McKenna. About psychedelics and what are they doing in this fine 
situation. Well, what they're doing is, is forcing this maturation process by dissolving boundaries, which is what they do. They are exposing the cultural operating system for what it is, which is just a bunch of hacked together rules that evolved over time. They weren't sent from God, from Mount Sinai. Uh, it's just a bunch of hacked together rules. So psychedelics in that sense spread alienation. But what they alienate us from is preposterous, earth murdering, sexist, consumerist, shallow, trivial, inane, insane, and dangerous. And that's what they alienate us from. Terence's brother, Dennis McKenna, is one of the most influential figures in psychedelics and a counterculture legend. I think we're living through a pretty strange, dangerous, exciting time in psychedelics. So, you know, psychedelics are, are going mainstream very quickly. Uh, we're seeing a rise of you know, psychedelic capitalism, a big gold rush. It's something we've, we've covered quite a lot on the channel and been quite focused on. And, you know, as, as one of the elders of, of this kind of... Um, community movement, whatever you might call it. I was really keen to hear, what do you make of all of the, the changes in the last few years? Well, uh, I, uh, I'm astonished for one thing. You know, I mean, I think back in the day, we never imagined that, uh, uh, you know, that psychedelics, that something like psilocybin would rise to the position that it has and begin to be recognized, you know, for its virtues because, these were all, and they still are pretty much schedule one controlled substances in the States. So, and similarly uh, in different countries, they're, they're not ill, they're not legal by a long shot, but I think the momentum of recognition that these are actually important medicines, that they do have value as medicines, that's changing the conversation. So I, I'm delighted to hear that because, you know, I, I mean, I, I do think that these medicines are part of the culture, even though they were made illegal at pretty much at the end of the 60s with the Controlled Substances Act and all that, but they never really went away. I mean, there, there were low points, but they were never completely abandoned. And I think partly what has changed is that all those people back at the, in the 60s and early 70s my generation, you know, I mean, we were just young hippie rebels or whatever at that time. Well, now we're old and respectable, more or less. And, uh, and, and I, I think many of the people who have had these experiences with psychedelics are now in a position in regulatory agencies and, and corporations and, and science and government and so on. So, uh, you know, and, and they, they've had their own experiences. So they know that, you know, and, and they remember them as valuable. And, and so they know that they're not many of the stories and horror stories that were propagated through the 60s are just not true. So there's a more reasonable, there's not the, uh, you know, feeling of hysteria that there was. But how did all these rebels bring these sacred transformative medicines into the mainstream? they snuck it in. A popular idea in the psychedelic counterculture for years has been what I call the psychedelic Trojan horse. The idea was to sneak psychedelics into the mainstream in a container of medicalization, and then watch as they change our minds collectively. In some ways, it's been a wildly successful strategy, but it's also had unintended consequences. Psychedelic experiences are greatly affected by our expectations, our mindset, and our cultural beliefs. Stanislav Grof famously called them non-specific amplifiers, meaning they amplify what's already in our minds. So when it comes to psychedelics, the horse is just as important as what's inside it. If you give away the horse, the whole cultural narrative around psychedelics, you also give away a lot of control over the experience itself. Big Pharma, the well-being industry, biomedical science, start to control the narrative. And that's quite a significant problem. To see why, we can invoke an ancient Canaanite god called Moloch. 
Moloch is a popular metaphor among people interested in game theory, which is a branch of mathematics that analyzes strategies for dealing with competitive situations. So here's former poker pro and game theory expert Liv Barry explaining Moloch. If there's this force of something that's driving the you know, emergence and complexity, there seems to be this opposing force, which is a, f a force of destruction that sort of uses competition for ill. Um, and you know the way the way I'm terming it, I'm, I'm doing a video series on this, um, and I, I'm terming it as basically Moloch is the god of of unhealthy competition, of negative sum games. So competitive interactions that make the world worse off for their existence as opposed to being neutral or better. Um, because games can be good or bad, you know? And, um, and so Moloch is kind of like this personification of that. Um, but in reality, what it is, is just this, this like dumb blind force of like evolution and economics, uh, where basically you'll have these systems where individuals are incentivized to do sort of the selfish thing, kind of like a prisoner's dilemma, like a multi-person prisoner's dilemma, um, where they, everyone is in, individually incentivized to do the thing that will give them a short-term gain. Um, but if everyone does that, then everyone in, overall ends up worse off. So from basically from a God's eye view, everyone should do the cooperative thing. But in reality, because it's so hard to get so many people to coordinate, um, there's no way of enforcing it, uh, then everyone ends up in a bad place. And that's, you know, it's called a multipolar trap, um, or a Moloch trap, as I like to call it. And here's author Jamie Wheel explaining how game theory plays out in the psychedelic space. And I think one of the most relevant for this situation is um, the notion of the multipolar trap, which is just the simplest way to say it is if somebody is definitely going to be a dick, it might as well be me. Because of that logic, it drives good people to a sociopathic conclusion, not because they are actually sociopaths themselves, but they have, they have decent evidence, right, on behalf of their stakeholders that someone else is a sociopath. Therefore, we, we must for rational self-preservation. And so that's where the whole thing of like, I've looked into their eyes, I've seen their soul, we've broken bread, we've tripped for a night. Right, they've told me their profound journey story, which brought them to this space. Right, that, all those things go out the fucking window. The main place we've seen these dynamics showing up is in companies using aggressive patent strategies to corner the market. Now, not-for-profits like MAPS, the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies, have been looking at alternatives to patenting. Here's its founder, Rick Doblin. So I started MAPS in 1986, which is 35 years ago. We've since raised over $100 million in donations. Um, most of that money we've raised in the last couple of years. So in the last two years, we've raised uh, about $45 million, all in donations. Pretty amazing. But <clears throat> in that same time, the for-profit psychedelic companies have raised over a billion dollars. So it's not the case that uh, venture capital is the only way to go. We've been able to do this, use Sona, is also working on donated funds to develop psilocybin for major depressive disorder. But it's getting much more difficult to raise philanthropy now because so many people want to invest because there's all these opportunities for investing. So I think what we have to be wary of now is what is standard in business is attempts to make overbroad patents and then make people spend a lot of money to attack overbroad patents and then big wealthy companies that have hundreds of millions or billions of dollar market cap can then um, drain resources from smaller companies who won't, won't be able to fight these overbroad patents. So the concern that I have is this overbroad patents. If people want to patent new ideas or if people want to patent new molecules, if they want to tweak, there are several companies that are now trying to develop um, alternatives to MDMA that would be either shorter acting or somehow or other better in one way or another. And if they want to do that and they want to patent their new creations, <clears throat> I'm not opposed to that at all. In fact, I think that that's fine. You know, it's really the overbroad aggressive use of the patents to try to block competitors. That's the real problem. The biggest psychedelic pharma company compass pathways has also received the most criticism for its patenting strategy. In May 2021, 
I had a public debate with its co-founder, Lars Wild. I think we have to address the fact that, you know, there's been a lot of pushback uh, in the press around Compass's patent strategy. And the main concern, uh, one of them, I think, uh, which would be really good to talk about, is the fact that the, the patenting a polymorph of psilocybin um, is, isn't quite the same as a new chemical entity in many people's minds. So that, that's one thing. But the other thing is that because of Compass's first mover advantage and the fact that you have so much money and so much funding, you're able to, I'm not saying this is your intention, but you would be in a position where you could very easily make it very difficult for new players to enter the market. Because if I want, if I want to start a psilocybin a company, I have to go to a VC now, and they not only do I have to get funding from my from the VC, but I have to get funding in case you sue me for potentially having your polymorph. And it is incredibly expensive for me to get the experts required to look at polymorph chemistry, which is very, very difficult, requires lots of expensive machinery, lots of experts. So, you know, I've, you know, some lawyers that I've spoken to have, have, have compared it to sort of uh, napalming the field and then laying landmines. So making it difficult for people to come uh, after, uh, the, after you, basically. And I think that's the main concern. And that, that's something I'd really just love to um, talk about now, because I think it's kind of uh, key to everything else. We're not napalming the field. Um, may, maybe I start because I think that's in the interest of the wider group here. Uh, historically, you know, how did our patent strategy come about? What are we doing? You know, solving a lot of problems along the way. Uh, we we protected uh, the synthesis that we had developed, where we spent uh, significant uh, investment on. And then when we eventually decided which uh, uh, of the polymorphs to develop. Uh, we found one that we found suitable for our drug product. Uh, and when analyzing that, we realized that that polymorphic form had not been described uh, in the uh, prior art, in the work that had been done by Sandoz or anyone else. And now maybe very briefly, what is um, what is a polymorph? Uh, polymorph is a certain salt form uh, of a, a chemical entity. And uh, so that is what we protected. Um, why is that important to us? Because otherwise, you know, we would be spending hundreds of millions uh, to develop psilocybin uh, through clinical trials to come to market. And uh, as soon as the regulatory uh, protection expires, uh, we would have severe competition from generics, uh, the Tevas of this world that would come in with hugely uh, efficient operations that would flood the market uh, with psilocybin, uh, competing away any uh, profitability uh, with uh, psilocybin. But not for profits like MAPS argue that there are alternatives to patenting. Now, as far as patenting, uh, that's definitely not essential. Um, there are other incentives that have been developed for um, moving forward with drugs that are off patent. And actually, Ronald Reagan signed a bill into law in 1984 that created incentives called data exclusivity. And so what that means is that if you are working with a drug that's off patent, either the composition of matter patent or the um, use patents, that if you make that into a medicine, um, data exclusivity means that no one can use your data. You have exclusive use of your data to market. In the US, it's gonna be five years. It's gonna be 10 years in Europe. Now it's different than a patent in that other sponsors, if they wanted to use their own data and generate their own data, they could do that. It doesn't block other people from doing their own research, but it blocks them from using your data. So data exclusivity, I think, is a really good alternative to patents. It makes patents not essential. They still can be valuable. Um, and then philanthropy has been um, working for us and for others, but it's getting increasingly difficult. So we're going to have to see how that works out going forward. Another important alternative to an extractive capitalist model is the idea of indigenous reciprocity. I, I do think that these medicines are, are valuable for individuals, but also catalysts for social change and, and that sort of thing. But then I'm also a bit conflicted because, you know, uh, this, this gold rush to cash in, the capitalist side of it, it's inevitable 
and it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I'm not anti-capitalist, but I am pro-ethics. And I think here's the, here's the issue. We, if this is going to, the psychedelics are going to be integrated into mainstream society or our, you know, global society. We have to recognize their origins are in indigenous societies, indigenous cultures, and we owe big debt to them for being the stewards of this knowledge for essentially thousands of years. And in order to bring psychedelics into global culture, uh, we need to acknowledge that debt and especially the, the venture capitalist side of things needs to make a moral ethical commitment to giving uh, indigenous people some stake, you know, hopefully a big stake, but just being, uh, you know, implementing reciprocity, you know, we owe them a lot for just keeping this knowledge and keeping the genetics as well of the plants, you know, and all of that is now threatened. A charity called the Chakruna Institute has recently launched an indigenous reciprocity initiative. Here's its founder, Dr. Bia Labach. I feel the Chakruna Institute has had a leadership and has uh, helped pioneer and champion this concept that if you're interested in psychedelic science and psychedelic use, if you're part of the psychedelic so-called renaissance, you should look at the roots and the origin of this movement. And so we are all here because of indigenous people. We are all heirs of indigenous people. Even if you only like psilocybin or synthetic masculine or LSD or MDMA, and you think, oh, wow, what I'm doing here has nothing to do with indigenous people, and therefore I, I owe nothing, you're wrong. All of us owe something because it was through studying uh, the indigenous people's rituals, shamanism, their practices, their ceremonies, that scientists learned a lot about the psychedelic uh, potentials, therapeutic potentials of these substances. And a lot, there is this big continuity between shamanism, the underground, uh, ritual, uh, traditional practices, and then underground therapeutic circles, and then the above ground clinical trial FDA uh, approach. So all of this is part of the same movement, either because we're using the same substances or because we studied their substances and created new ones, uh, laboratorial versions of those, or because we just studied the practices and got the idea that these substances heal, such as, for example, famous researchers in Canada that participated in Native American teepees and by observing how Native Americans use peyote to treat alcoholism, uh, started to propose a similar study with LSD. So we're trying to support indigenous people on their own terms. What does this mean? It means supporting their autonomy, supporting their sovereignty, and supporting their rights to self-determination. So as Dennis McKenna points out, indigenous reciprocity is complex. In fact, some psychedelic companies are already using it to tie-dye their image as socially conscious. So similar to how oil companies greenwash to make themselves look more sustainable. But indigenous reciprocity is vitally important. And there are some interesting experiments going on at the moment. So one is Kene Rao, an IP defense fund and factory run by Shipibo Canibo people in Peru. It's led by Demer Vasquez. Nosotros como Shipibo siempre trabajamos tres pilares. La solidaridad, la hermandad y la reciprocidad. Siempre lo hemos transmitido eso. Para nosotros, esos tres pilares son fundamentales. La reciprocidad en nuestra cultura, pues, es la esencia de cada, cada día, la vida cotidiana como pueblo chipivo con ello. Por último, nuestra finalidad como primero es dar la asistencia técnica a nivel legal, a nivel de asesoramiento, a nivel de enseñar sea en eh, idioma chipivo, sea en eh, hacer bordajes, sea en pintados del, del diseño con el chipivo, porque es muy importante, porque eh, es la esencia, la matriz de nuestra cultura como pueblo chipivo con ello. ¿no? Queremos que a través de nuestra enseñanza y aprendizaje de que 
también el pueblo chipivo también no pierda esa esencia cultural a, a, a través del Khmer. Para nosotros como empresa es muy importante, ¿no? Es muy importante abrir el mercado, ¿no? Abrir el mercado o, o buscar el mercado para nosotros también poder, poder también promocionar nuestro, nuestro ayahuasca, ¿no? Porque es importante, ¿no? Porque es la medicina, así como existen la, eh, los medicamentos farmacéuticos, los medicamentos convencionales, eh, otros tipos de, de pastillas, me gustaría que también que la ayahuasca también sea una alternativa, una alternativa dentro de la medicina convencional, dentro de, pero quizás con otro tipo de, de conocimiento como medicina, como el ayahuasca, porque la ayahuasca tiene, bueno, para mí el ayahuasca es algo sagrado. Kene Rao is trying to respond to market capitalism on its own terms, but another option is not to play the for-profit game at all, and instead democratize access to psychedelics. So one interesting example of that is what's going on in Oregon, where a successful campaign led by two therapists, Tom and Sherry Eckert, legalized psilocybin therapy at the end of 2019. Sadly, Sherry passed away shortly after they achieved this. Here's Tom Eckert talking about what it now means for Oregon. Metro 109, state ballot initiative, originally inspired to set forth an initiative and a movement here in Oregon to create access to psilocybin assisted therapy as well as wellness services. So uh, my wife and I got the ball rolling after uh, having a dialogue around an article we read, you may have, you may remember it from uh, Michael Paul in the trip treatment. It kind of covered the, sci the, the science that was happening at the time. And it really wasn't, uh, you know, too much out there like it is now. It was, um, I had some awareness of psychedelic science, but that really clicked with both of us and started a conversation around how best to integrate psychedelic medicine, psychedelic therapy, and even psychedelic wellness services uh, back into the culture. And so that dialogue led to a, a feeling that there's something we could do here. Um, and that led to us really outlining a detailed vision around uh, what that might look like. Um, and that led to Measure 109, eventually. Uh, it was a improbable journey, uh, exciting journey. It was a lot of attitude shifted in that time. We always aimed for 2020, right, from 2015, because we uh, kind of understood that the attitudes were going to shift as the science became more available and um, that was helped along by Michael Pollan's book and other factors in the culture. And so it really caught fire. And here in Oregon, you know, we just started out humble beginnings, traveling around the state, talking to people, getting in front of anyone who would listen. And it was always received with a fair amount of excitement uh, in the psychedelic, psychedelic bubble, at least. Um, and a little bit of, you know, is that really possible? You know, is that... There was a fair amount of skepticism if the culture was ready. Um, but yeah, we really wanted to advance a model that um, created broad access, you know, not based on qualifying conditions, diagnoses, uh, but rather made available uh, psychedelic services to anyone who might safely benefit. So the key word there is safely. It's kind of like turning the um, science, the research model around and saying instead of zeroing in on specific populations that might benefit we want to turn it around and say we want to open up access to anyone who isn't contraindicated so clearly there's an important process there to identify you know who can safely benefit but we want to open up those channels and that's what we're doing in Oregon so in 2020 November 2020 uh, went to the vote a statewide ballot that's the you know, presidential election on the ballot with everything else. Um, so it was an exciting night, all in all. Uh, we won with something of a mandate, you know, 56% of the vote. That's 1.3 million people voted yes on psilocybin therapy and services in Oregon. And definitely got a kick out of just the fact that everybody in Oregon was presented the vote and had to think about psychedelic services and what that meant. 
and it started a real conversation here. It was almost a kitchen table kind of issue where folks wanted to learn about it, and uh, and that led to uh, the victory. Brilliant. And what, what's next? So the, the ballot has passed, and now now what's the process of? Um, yeah, what, what are the next steps and, and how do you envisage in the next few years psilocybin therapy, for example, being uh, available in Oregon? Yeah, so part of what we wrote into the initiative was this two-year development period. So once the initiative passed, it kicked off a period where we really developed the program. Now, the, the initiative itself was detailed and created a cohesive framework, but there's openings and, and, and areas that were intentionally left open so that uh, an advisory board of experts, which was appointed by the governor, uh, which was also part of what we wrote into the legislation, uh, have, would have an opportunity to really flesh out what this framework is going to look like. And it's a lot of work. So I'm on that advisory board. In fact, I chair the advisory board. I'm not speaking in that capacity right now because that work is ongoing. Um, but there's lots of areas to figure out from training to licensing, service center licensing, product licensing, how facilitators are trained, what that looks like. Um, you know, all, all, those, all those moving pieces that ultimately will come to fruition in 2023 when licenses will be uh, come online and services will start to be rendered in Oregon. Um, maybe one of the most <clears throat> unique and interesting aspects of it, and perhaps also one of the most controversial, is the, the fact that you don't have to necessarily be a pre-existing therapist to, to get a license. I'm really curious about that and, and would love to hear a little bit more uh, about that. So how do you envisage, and I understand it's still ongoing, but how do you envisage um, someone who does want to work with, say, psilocybin and hold space for people, what, what might it look like? What kind of training might they go through? What are the kind of thoughts that you're playing with right now? Just backing up a little bit, one of the core inspirations for the initiative was to move psilocybin therapy and psilocybin services a little bit outside of the conventional medical paradigm. So when we first looked at the landscape, um, we saw the kind of pre-existing frameworks out there that um, some folks would think to kind of move in one of those directions. We thought that uh, psilocybin therapy, psychedelic therapy more generally deserves its own foundation, its own platform with a, with a unique regulatory framework, a uh, unique ecosystem, if you will. And so that, starting from that point, just creatively thinking about what model best fits the offering, you know, um, we want it to be as rational and as thoughtful as possible. And we concluded that while Prior credentialing in medicine or psychotherapy is certainly in, in some ways very helpful. Uh, psychedelic therapy, psilocybin therapy, and wellness, um, it's kind of its own discipline, right? And so we wanted to create pathways for people to get involved, to have the heart and discipline to do this kind of work, whether they've been doing it in different contexts. And we certainly absolutely invite you know, credentialed folks to be involved. I imagine that will be the bulk of folks who get involved, but we wanted to create some avenues for those uh, who have that, have what it takes to be facilitators to get involved and not just kind of cut them off uh, due to credentialing. So this is all part of the vision of an integrated framework, you know, addressing a spectrum from prevention to wellness, to therapy, to medicine. And that's what's really kind of revolutionary about the Oregon model, even before you get to psychedelics, to have a regulated uh, framework that has that kind of scope. And then to use psychedelic medicine in that context is pretty exciting. These aren't the only responses to psychedelic capitalism. There are religious freedom initiatives, decriminalization movements, cognitive liberty campaigns. And right now, we're in a psychedelic turf war for which of these gets narrative control. Here's Kat Kanur, one of the founders of the North Star Ethics Pledge, which has been trying to create ethical guidelines for organizations entering the psychedelic space. Like big pharma is not interested in the same conversation that we're interested in. I don't sense. And they're not really interested in coming to the table with us. And 
if you take out the, I mean, this is where it's like the patent plays are what get really concerning, right? Because it's one thing like you do you, we'll do us. How do we build the biodiversity of the ecosystem over here of people who are aligned with the North Star Pledge? But it comes back to this both and. Mm -hmm. Like as long as we can create a world where they can go do that and others can go do something else and create regenerative economic models that are inclusive both in the process, the administration, the leadership, and the distribution of profits and funding can go can support diverse communities and and not go into the hands of the few and access to medicines for the few then the more the merrier um hmm. but we will be seeing over the coming years what what the impact of patents filed um and business approaches for those with a lot of power and funding um, what that will really do. And then many folks will, after popping heads up, are going to go back down, um, and move to the more creative, um, solutions that have been here all along and that we'll keep finding. Creating the healthy ecosystem that Kat's talking about feels vital right now. And it's something Jamie Wheel speaks to really well here. So there's, there's that question, which is, is it possible in the modern cash economy to have an exchange over what is ultimately and potentially an ineffable and sacred initiatory experience compared to a clinical medical treatment? So that just that differentiation, because the moment you've even done that, you've typecast the recipient of those compounds. Because in one, they're a congregant. And then the role of a minister is to oversee their flock, right? And, and their, their duty is to be shepherding the soul, the ensoulment of their congregants. If you are a patient, right, then you have, then you have, you are a receipt, you know, you're under phys physician's care and your job is to be rendered back above, you know, to, to, to the tyranny of the zero, back to normal. And if you are a venture firm running one of these for-profit things, then you've got a customer, and the goal of a customer is lifetime recurring revenue and margin. And each of the same person having the same interior experience or more to the point having the same pharmacological experience, their interior experience and how they are managed and how they are related to through that experience, wildly different. And so, so my sense is, is that the, the pharmacological model, which again, I mean, that was a decision that, that Maps and, and uh, Hefter and others, you know, made back in the day, which was let's try and get this to mainstream legal credibility, was a was a great strategy with unintended consequences. The more I've been involved in this conversation around psychedelic capitalism, the more I've come to think of that these alternative models are always going to lose to Moloch. Consumer culture values the economy over everything, so our cultural values are dictated by broken incentive structures. Here's Daniel Schmachtenberger laying out this dynamic. When I think about what economics is, economics is our value system codified as value equations that determines how much we value one thing relative to another thing that determines what we're incentivized to do and what we confer power to. So if a dead whale is worth a million dollars on a fishing boat and a live whale in the ocean is worth nothing, that's a value system codified in a value equation that then incentivizes behavior, but it also incentivizes psychopathology, right? Psychopathy, actually. I have to shut empathy down because leaving the whale in the ocean, it actually isn't even going to stay in the ocean. Another guy's going to hunt it out, right? So I've got a tragedy of the common, so I have to kind of deaden to be able to do the thing that is incentivized by the system. But when our cultural values are broken, we need to create new ones. And these values are upstream from everything else. They are, in large part, what radically changes the choices we make collectively. As the saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. The paradox is this, psychedelics can help us make these new frames, but only if there's a cultural narrative around them that allows that to happen. So instead of trying to mainstream psychedelics into our existing cultural narrative, I think the focus should be on mainstreaming them with a cultural narrative. And this idea of building your own culture is one of Terence McKenna's most important contributions.
What's really important is, I call it the felt presence of direct experience, which is a fancy term which just simply means we have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Don't watch TV. Don't read magazines. Don't even listen to NPR. Create your own road show. The nexus of space and time where you are now is the most immediate sector of your universe. And if you're worrying about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else, then you are disempowered. You're giving it all away to icons. Icons which are maintained by an electronic media so that you want to dress like X or have lips like Y or something. This is shit-brained, this kind of thinking. Right now, there's really no such thing as a psychedelic culture. There's lots of different psychedelic tribes with differing worldviews. But we could build one. And I think one place to start is by identifying shared values among all these different tribes. And that's why I've created the Psychedelic Value Survey, which launches in 2022. And it's designed to map the values of all these different groups and see if there are any values that are shared, uh, the hope being of starting a new conversation about building psychedelic culture. And lastly, I think that any new cultural narrative around psychedelics has to see them as sacred. The sacred doesn't have to be religious. It's what we set aside as higher than our own self-interest. For example, in secular societies, we see human life or free speech as sacred. And psychedelic researcher Bob Jesse has a similar idea with the concept of psychedelic exceptionalism, which is about seeing them as different and unique compared to other mental health drugs. I think this focus on the sacred is essential because without something higher than our own egos to move towards, we inevitably fall back into game theory traps, so back to Moloch. And it might be that building a psychedelic metaculture is overly ambitious, but I think if we get it right, the potential is huge. And Tom Eckert put it really beautifully when we spoke. I tell the story sometimes about how we came to the final conclusion there. Sherry and I eventually packed up the car and went up to Mount Rainier uh, with the purpose of consulting the mushroom as to whether we were going to move forward with this uh, enterprise or this, this, uh, this effort. And out there in the woods, the ancient growth forest with Mount Rainier uh, in the background, sun going down, we have the fire going, it's just us out there. And I remember I got into my own head, there was a period of silence between the two of us. And uh, I was in my own head thinking about Kind of the implications of, of taking this on and my mind kind of went way out into the future you know i thought i don't know maybe a thousand years into the future right and i thought well if humanity is going to survive we'll obviously have to have done something right and i wondered and i there's more less thought and more kind of a resonance you know how it is when you're deep in there and i had this sense of that deep future looking back and kind of thinking about what future historians way out there would imagine or think about our, our time, think about our way of living. And I concluded that they probably wouldn't care so much about our technologies or stupid politics that are going on. I think they'd really notice how disconnected we are from our inner resources. You know, the, conscious, the consciousness, the healing forces within us, the ability to connect and understand wholeness. I think that sense of separation and fragmentation would be what would stick out. And I began to see that this was an important piece to that evolution. The psychedelics, you know, they're not a panacea. I'm not trying to oversell anything, but they are a step in the direction of getting reconnected. And I think that can be done in lots of ways, but psychedelics are particularly interesting in that regard. They go right to that place, right? This is a really extraordinary time. In a culture that's run out of ideas and is on the brink of self-destruction, substances that can radically change our frame on reality are suddenly going mainstream. But for us to really get it right and to listen to what psychedelics can teach us, I think we need to relate to them differently. To me, that means connecting to them 
as many in the ancient world did to the sacred. Not as something that's there to look after us, but something that we need to look after. Thanks for watching.